All right, so I'm stoked to introduce my next guest. Uh, he is what I call the Michael Jordan of functional dentistry. Uh, his unique insights on uh, oral health, sleep, and overall health has completely changed my life and also the lives of hundreds of thousands of people out there in the world. And Dr. B, Dr. Burheny, Dr. Mark Burheny, I want to welcome you to the podcast. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for inviting me and uh, always happy to be part of the discussion. And thanks for that intro. Yeah. I've yeah. Never, never had it quite like that. That's great. <laughs> I do consider you to be the forefront of what we, what you could, you would call functional dentistry, what I would call holistic dentistry. Um, I, I, one of the things I love about you is the fact that you're not like most dentists, obviously. Uh, most dentists want to keep on having their patients back in their chair. In your case, you want to prevent your clients or your subjects from going to your chair in the first place. And I think a lot of what you post on Instagram and Twitter is, uh, is very just preventative, which is what we should be talking about. And one of the things I wanted to jump into first before anything is how does a dentist get interested in sleep? Wow, uh, that's I've never been asked it that way. Uh, well, the this, the answer is simple for me. Uh, I had sleep apnea and I didn't know it. Um, but these days, uh, it would be looking towards a functional curriculum, which really doesn't exist. Uh, I have a network of subscribers of dentists that are on a, a directory, and and because we, my daughter and I, by creating askthedentist.com, our our primary website. And of course, the Instagram posts that we make, we, we, we answer a lot of questions, but we actually, you know, raise a lot of questions. And then and then they want to go to a dentist that can talk the same talk. And and that's wasn't possible. And so that's why we created this directory. So so I think dentists get this education either from something that's happened to them, a, a personal health journey or issue. Uh, it could also be that they're functionally minded or kind of health nerds, what I call a health nerd. I was a health nerd when I was 17. I was reading books on longevity when my friends were, you know, reading books on how to rebuild a, a motor, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so it, it comes from the person, from the practitioner at, at this point. Eventually it will be in the curriculum. I started this about 10 years ago and I've been hammering this point where, you know, functional dentistry is better than conventional dentistry. That, that fill, drill, bill, uh, kind of modality is, is just, it, it's, it's okay. I mean, we need good clinicians, but we need more than that. And the primary uh, role of a healthcare provider, the word doctor does mean in, from the Latin uh, uh, root, the verb to t is to teach. And that is our primary goal is not to heal. So, so, uh, you know, when I retired from dentistry, which was right before COVID, that was uh, a coincidence, but very lucky in many ways, um, you know, and it, before then as well, but now I'm teaching and, and that is so important. So I'm not just teaching to people on Instagram and, and giving those tips that you mentioned, um, but, uh, but also to providers. So the curriculum will come in dental schools, but it's still probably 10 years away, unfortunately. So that's where it comes from. Uh, I think it comes from the personality of the provider primarily. They, 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 they know something else is out there. They're not happy with, oh, my patients keep coming in. And, you know, even though I tell them to brush and floss their cavities or mm -hmm. gum disease, or I'm pulling their teeth out every time they come in. And so they, they know they're frustrated and they want something better. So that's where it comes from. Amazing. And, uh, I, I, I want to, I want to put this out there that, uh, I put out a tweet, uh, this is before we actually got introduced to each other. And then. Uh, and then I remember I put out this tweet, which said was like, uh, you know, my dentist said I'm grinding in my sleep. Uh, he must understand the hustle. I did that out of a joke. And then, um, and then when I underneath that tweet, which is like a quote tweet, I was like, Hey, uh, can anyone help me with this? Like, can, can anyone please help me with this? Uh, so they said a bunch of things, reduce stress, get more sleep, all, all this kind of stuff. And then they came to mouth taping and then you, once I actually started to research mouth taping, I was starting to read your blog a lot and coincidentally you quote tweeted me and you're like, if your dentist is saying that without properly fixing your sleep, then right. I, 
I don't think you said along the lines of fire dentist, but I took it along the lines that I should fire my dentist, which I did actually. So how exactly did you come about uh, discovering mouth tape? And uh, can you actually run us through the gamut of, of what mouth taping is and why it's so beneficial? Absolutely. I've got some right here we can talk about. I love talking about mouth taping. Unfortunately, I've been talking about it so much that uh, a lot of people have run with it, a lot of TikTokers. There's mm-hmm. been a lot of uh, pushback on mouth taping. We'll, we'll get into that. But essentially, I came across it, again, through my, uh, my journey with, with realizing, being told by my daughters one morning that, you know, Dad, you're snoring, and, mm-hmm. and my wife as well. And, and we were both healthcare professionals, and we just didn't know any better. And we were in our 40s and healthy, and I was climbing, you know, uh, 15,000 foot peaks and skiing down them and sleeping in the snow and mountain biking and, and doing, you know, very, very active and really never thought anything of it uh, until I was told that I snored. And then I realized, and I made the connections. And then I wrote a book on sleep uh, with, along with my daughter, uh, because I found the journey to be so difficult in getting care here in the U.S., for sleep. So that's when I that's when I first came across mouth taping. Mouth taping's been around for a while. It's kind of a buteco thing, malfunctional breathing thing. But for me, it quickly I saw it as this wonderful opportunity to help me be a better dentist and to move along that diagnostic tree a lot quicker. I mean, I would ask people because then I, you know, once I treated myself and my wife and family members, then I became uh, you know, uh more uh, academically involved at the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, learned everything I needed to know about sleep, and then applied that to my patients. And this tape, the fact of literally, and it, it is what it sounds like, covering your lips with tape and preventing airflow through the mouth and forcing it more through the nose, assuming you can do that. And again, that we need to flush that out as well. But mm. that allowed me to bypass this process of going of asking my patients, you know, do you snore at night? Uh, do you breathe through your nose? Can you breathe through your nose? If so, does your mouth fall open at night? What does your sleep partner say? And and especially that conversation with men, especially, was very difficult because it was like, oh yeah, my mouth's closed all night. I can breathe through my nose, and and I don't snore. So that that took months to get through, and and sometimes we wouldn't even get through it. That 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 wall of denial, which which I suffered from as well uh, initially. So. So I would just go right cut to the chase, say, you know, I'm going to lie you down. Let's see how long you can tape for. I would tape in front of the patient. Then they would tape. I would have them tape. I would hold a mirror for them. And then I would watch them. And they're relaxed. It's not quite deep sleep. but And then I would see how quickly that tape would come off. Some patients would go look at me and go, oh, there's no way I'm going to put tape over my mouth. They know inherently that they can't breathe through their nose. They're very protective of this part of the airway because that's all they've got. Uh, those are the patients that are difficult patients for, for a dentist. They, they gag a lot. They have to spit a lot. They have to sit upright a lot. Um, so, so this would cut right through it. Now, if they could tape, then I would say, go home. I would give them the tape. I'm going to text you in the morning. I want to see how you did. And it allowed me to determine whether they needed a referral to a sleep medical doctor, to a sleep MD for sleep issues. Now, at, before all this happened, I would assess just even by looking at their face, by doing an enteral exam, I, or even infants, uh, tongue tie, I mean, lack of breastfeeding. I mean, I quickly come to that opinion that this person has a sleep issue. The sleep tape gets me there quicker as to what that patient needs. So, so I came across it uh, in researching my book. I had never known about it or, you know, had heard, even heard about it. And again, this is dental school, right? They don't talk about this. They don't talk about breathing in this way. They don't even talk about how important nasal breathing is. So, so um, I started doing it and I, as you, as many people, but not everyone, noticed the effect the next morning. I mean, and that was enough for me. And then I did the research and I realized, you know, by forcing the air through your nose, certain things happen in your body. Uh, pH of your blood, sympathetic tone, better sleep, less chance of snoring because the air going through your nose comes in at a different velocity, at a different rate, at a different amount of volume. So it doesn't pinch, you know, that that Bernoulli's principle where if you have a small tube and the tube that we have here is small, it's a tapioca straw Hmm. with soft, fleshy 
fatty tissue around it with muscles on the outside. And those muscles collapse late at night in REM sleep and deep sleep. That's natural. I uh, like all our muscles do. The only muscles that are working are the diaphragm, the eye muscles. There is an inner ear muscle that is still working. They just discovered that, but that's it. Everything else is shut down. Well, when that airway collapses and a lot of air comes rushing through, if it comes in through the mouth, guess what? It pinches closed. Uh, and, and then that's a snore. That's an apnea. That's a, an arousal. So, so mouth taping redirects the air, humidifies the air. It activates the nose. Uh, your nasal tissues come online. There's nitric oxide formation that produces effects in the body as well. It's good for the immune system. It helps vasodilation, relaxation. So yeah, breathing through the nose is huge and uh, nothing new. Uh, uh, James Nestor wrote a book on, on breathing, which is fabulous. Um, and I highly recommend everyone read that. I think that's one of the, it's one of my favorite, uh, uh, health books probably in, in for, for the last five years. Mm. It's, it's that good and that important to read. But, um, I mean, mouth breathing and nose breathing was recognized. Uh, there's a document in that book, uh, that James Nestor brings forth, uh, from a dentist in the 1800s in England that talks about the difference between nose breathing and mouth breathing, but somehow it got lost and mm. now it's reappearing. It's having its moment. Yeah. Finally. I feel like, uh, the things that we do on a regular basis are so overlooked when it comes to say breathing or even sleeping that people underrate them to a very large degree in terms of like how much impact it can have on our health. And what do you think led to this evolution of us starting to breathe through our mouths instead of our nose? Because I know that nose breathing is uh, somewhat natural to us. It should be natural to us. But what do you think led to this evolution where we started to breathe through our mouths? That's a great question. Um, and I won't be able to give you a perfect answer, um, but you're right. The nose is designed to do the breathing. Uh, mouth breathing is for emergency breathing. Uh, now we weren't triathletes when our ancestors were not triathletes. They didn't run for a hundred miles. That was not what we were built to do. We were built to run short distances and, and, um, you know, to run from, from a predator or from a fire. Mm. Uh, we were good. We were built to be good walkers, walking and nose breathing go very well together. That rhythm, um, that cadence of breathing through your nose and walking that, that is absolutely brilliant in terms of, you know, if you want to achieve wellness and exercise. That's a great combo. We can talk about that later, but, but, um, but to answer your question, why, I mean, I can nose breathe. I'm a good nose breather. Um, I can put on those little breathe strips mm. and maybe get a little bit more air through my nose, but even so, and I can mouth tape, go through the night, never know that I have tape on my mouth, no struggle. Uh, there, there, there's that gray area where people can mouth tape, but they're still not getting enough air and oxygenation. So they, they toss and turn the tape may stay on, hmm. but, um, but even so my mouth will fall open. And I see this happen with everyone. Our mouths fall open when we sleep. And I just wish I had a ancestral answer to that. Why, <laughs> why would we be allowed to do that? Why would our bodies allow to allow that? Because it's not good for us. We, we sleep better. We gain uh, longer stages of deep sleep where we're happier. Uh, when we, we nose breathe. So it could be the way we sleep in modern society. It could be mattresses. It could be that we are allowed to sleep on our back. Our ancestors, I don't think slept on their back. That was a very vulnerable position, uncomfortable. Uh, they slept on their sides. They would, you know, dig a little hole for their hip and then build everything else up and they would curl up sideways. That is a better way to sleep, especially on your left side, as opposed to your right side. So I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you why our noses are more blocked these days mm. as opposed to our ancestors. And that is that simple air pollution, epigenetics, chemicals, um, uh, the inability to breastfeed due to midline defects, tongue tie, um, the development of our face. Uh, I mean, it's all about this, Dan. Mm -hmm. It's the width. This is my little dental school skull. Um, it's the width of the upper jaw, this distance to this distance. The wider that is, like our ancestors, the wider and more rounded that arch is. And when that, when you have that, the other structures, the other uh, bony structures in the mouth are wide as well. And that influences the airway. It influences the nasal passages. Mm. So when this distance gets pinched, 
uh, then everything else is smaller and we can't breathe through our nose. So that promotes mouth breathing. So many ways we can take this. And actually something came to mind is the fact that we evolved from hunter gatherers to industrial jobs, to doing what we do right now in front of desks. There has to be some sort of uh, correlation between that, but obviously I'm just like speaking out of my butt right now. Now, when I started to tape my mouth, one of the key things, in that, and thankfully I was able to actually recognize the changes on my aura ring. Now, before mouth taping, I was scoring maybe like 75 to maybe 80 on my uh, sleep scores. After mouth taping, I was scoring, now I regularly score around like 85, 87. Sometimes I hit 90, sometimes I hit above 90, which is ridiculous for me. And, uh, and one of the things that I realized when I was mouth taping was I thought that I would always be that guy that would wake up in the middle of the night and go pee because I had like a small bladder, but it wasn't really that it was because I was waking myself up with mouth breathing and, and it's, it's so jarring to a person for the last like 20 years to wake up multiple times at night and be just okay with that to time traveling from like the night to the morning, it's, it's the most jarring thing. And I'm like, you sometimes lose a part of the day that way. Cause you're just like, well, you know, I, you just don't wake up. Now you said something real. One of the things actually I, I found with mouth taping as well was a significant increase in my oral health. So I want to bring out a tweet that you uh, came out with, which was the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome communicate back and forth all day every day to the tune of 140 million bacteria exchanged every time you swallow. So why aren't doctors and dentists communicating? So my question to you is how exactly does our oral health uh, dictate or influence our overall physical health? It's a great question. Uh, it's a very, very important question to be able to answer for your, for oneself. Um, whether you're a physician, a dentist, or or just a layperson, a patient, um, and that feedback loop does it's it's more of a one way loop right now. I mean, not a loop, but a, a pathway. Uh, but we are discovering uh, a not a swallowing of bacteria kind of feedback loop back to the mouth. But as we know, the the body is so well interconnected. I mean. There's so many different connections and, and we keep discovering new ones all the time. You know, the gut microbiome to the brain, uh, you know, maybe there's a brain uh, biome, but the oral microbiome is very interesting and it's the second largest uh, biome in the body. There are biomes, I mean, armpit, uh, you know, uh, in the mouth, there are several niches of different types of biomes. We call those oral microbiome niches because they do vary. The mouth is a very interesting place. Um, because it's open to the environment, even though it's the beginning of the alimentary tract, the gut is more protected. The pH is more stable. There's less oxygen there. There's a big mix of oxygen and no oxygen deep in the pocket. So we, we, we have a variety of bacteria due to that because there are bacteria that like oxygen and then there are bacteria that don't like oxygen. So, so the mouth is a very unusual place. A lot of air going through there. It can dry out. It can stay wet. The pH changes are, are dramatic throughout the day especially at night, especially if you're breathing with your mouth open at night, because lack of saliva means an increase in pH. Mm. The saliva is a buffer uh, where the stomach is buffered, you know, by other fluids, but it's, it's more stable. So, so, but the connection, so it's a, it's a fascinating connection. Uh, certainly the, the oral microbiome is the mouth is feeding the gut. Yes. Some of those bacteria are destroyed in the gut, but it, it is seeding and interacting with the gut. So the premise here, to answer your question, you cannot achieve overall good systemic health if you have not addressed oral health. And the reason for that is that a lot of systemic infections and chronic diseases are either directly related to or indirectly related to oral disease. Uh, there's one stat out there, um, you know, seven out of 10 major chronic diseases have a direct connection with an oral bacterium. Mm -hmm. It's either present in the infection or it was seeded by that. Alzheimer's is a perfect example. Uh, it is now oral disease or an oral infection, gum disease, periodontal disease, is now a causative uh, 
a factor in Alzheimer's, not, not related to or correlated with. So that's the whole gingipan inflammatory uh, uh, a product that is produced by bacteria in the gums that goes right into the bloodstream. And, and that connection between bugs in the mouth is so prevalent to the rest of the body because it goes right into the bloodstream right away. There, there's a connection there where even after a dental cleaning, you have what's called a bacteremia within 10, 15 minutes. So as you're getting your teeth scraped, I don't want to scare anyone, those bacteria in the mouth are getting into your bloodstream. Well, once they're in the bloodstream, they can cross over the blood brain barrier. Uh, they can cross over a placental barrier to your child. So that connection is intimate. And that's why I tweeted that and, and Instagram that fact. We need to build more connective tissue between physicians and dentists because practicing in those two parallel, you know, non-communicating environments is really bad for the rest of us. I mean, because of this connection, this oral systemic connection. How would you, as a dentist, work together with a doctor uh, to get the best type of care necessary to save one of your clients? So the, that's a great question. The, the first time I enabled that on, on my behalf and on my patient's behalf was with sleep. So mm -hmm. in the sleep world, physicians can only do the diagnosing, even though dentists can recognize that decades sleep apnea decades before a physician can, because we're trained differently, but I could only screen for it and then send off to the physician. And that relationship was very rocky in the beginning because the physician would go, I'm getting a referral from a dentist. Yeah, you're fine. Mm. Because I would, I would catch it in people like you healthy. They look fine. Mm. And you know, they didn't have an aura ring. So there, there was very little data available to them, but I would say to them, listen, based on what I know, you have sleep apnea, send them off to the PCP primary care physician. And they would, they, they're, they're incentivized not to give the sleep study. It's a $3,000 study. Mm. And, and that's a whole different episode right there. But but, um, and it's different in Canada and it's not great in Canada either. Yeah. So, but it's a different system. So, so, so that was my first way of working with physician. And, and, you know, and over time it came to the point where I had had very well-known cardiologists calling me going, you know what, Dr. Brehenna, I'm so glad that you referred the patient to me. And I would refer back sometimes because they were doing procedures like ablations that really were more related to other issues, dental issues. So, so that relationship definitely got better. I actually learned how to bypass the primary care physician to get my patient that sleep study. Mm. And, and there were only maybe one or 2% of the cases that were borderline that came back that, you know, were, it was a, a kind of a gray zone. So, so, and then I actually created a letter which is available on our website. I can give you the link to it. It's called the Physician's uh, CRP Letter. And that's a letter that a patient, if they get a hold of, they can give to their dentist. The dentist will fill out and then they will take that letter and give it to the physician. And that letter brings together the two professions and it shows what's happening in the mouth could be influencing what the physician is treating, like heart disease. They're looking at CRP, uh, which is a measure of inflammation in the body but they're not aware that oral disease is one of the biggest con contributors uh, to uh, overall systemic disease. So if the physician is just trying to treat inflammation and lower it, and he's not aware of this oral disease here, I mean, it's just like you're running in circles. So we created that letter. That letter is in use all over the US, uh, I think even in Europe, uh, but usually by functional physicians and functional dentists. So, so how to do that? Um, you know, it, it could be up to the patient where the patient hears this and says, oh my God, uh, I'm gonna introduce my doctor to my dentist. And it could just be passing on paperwork. So if you're in that situation, I would tell the patient who's listening right now, the dental patient, ask your dentist to write a letter or use the CRP letter and include all the pocket readings. And if that needs to be explained to the physician why that is, and again, medical, uh, the medical curriculum treats the mouth down to the oropharynx as the little black box. That's up to dentists, that's drill and fill area. It's all heart tissues. And that oral systemic connection is not clear to them. So it's not made clear to them. So that's sad. So I would tell if, if, you're, a, if, if you're suffering from something, a chronic disease, and you have gum disease or some oral disease, even cavities, bad breath, gingivitis, connect the two in your mind at least, do the research and then get your doctors to start talking, get your dentist and your physician to start talking to each other. It will help you as a patient. Hmm. It, I, the outcome will be better. 
I have heard like correlations between heart disease and plaque buildup in, oh. in the mouth. Yeah. Um, and I don't think they're just correlated. I think one actually causes the other and they are just like symptoms of something that's greater going on. Now, where does mouthwash go into this? Cause I've been hearing, <clears throat> I've been hearing a lot of things about how mouthwash in general actually kills the good bacteria in your mouth. And I've been hearing this a lot from the people that we've been talking to on Twitter as well. They've been wanting me to ask you this. And what exactly are your thoughts on mouthwash and their effect on our oral microbiome and our overall dental health? So let, let's just look at mouthwash as a, as a liquid first. The, hmm. the act of swishing with any liquid, even, even water, is kind of a waste of time, unless you have a very dry mouth, but then you'd have to swish with water a lot. So flossing, and, and here's the problem. The, the oral health industry has created this product, this, this category of mouthwash, because they it's simple and it's cheap to make. It's a big bottle just with fluid, easy to manufacture. And, and plus it's an add-on to brushing and flossing. I mean, there's so many ways they make more money from this. Yeah. But out of the three, whether it's tongue scraping, brushing and flossing, or if you want to take it, the brushing, flossing, tongue scraping, a separate, uh, you know, components of oral care, uh, mouthwashing is, is the most ridiculous. It, it does the least. And then they add the chemicals and, you know, the, the disinfectants, the triclosan, the, the emulsifier soaps, surfactants, um, uh, alcohol, mm -hmm. uh, even pesticides. I mean, uh, and to try and kill the bacteria in the mouth and disinfect the mouth, which by the way, if you're successful lasts maybe five, 10 minutes before the mouth recovers. Um, it, it's just it, the actual action or mechanism of swishing with water just doesn't do what flossing and brushing does mm. uh, and tongue scraping. Those are mechanical. You're actually doing something. You're breaking up and reorganizing the biofilm. So, but then, these chemicals disinfect the mouth. And then we have studies, which I think you're refer you referred to or are thinking about um, when asking this question, that actually your blood pressure will go up after using a very strong disinfecting mouthwash. That's because you're killing bacteria in the mouth that, that do many things. One is they're nitrate producing and, and they produce nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is really the fountain of youth. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in many ways, because it lowers your blood pressure. It's a, it's a very short lived gas that, that can give better relaxed tone to your whole body so that you, you oxygenate your muscles and peripheral, uh, blood supply, uh, you know, tissues, uh, better, uh, and you know, to, to use a product that elevates your blood pressure where you're just trying to improve bad breath and it's not even addressing the root cause of oral disease. I mean, it's just, it's ludicrous. Mm -hmm. It's a huge billion dollar industry. Yeah. And, uh, this leads me into a, an alternative, uh, I guess you could say measure, and I'm not sure if it, if it's uh, real or if it's, uh, efficacy or not, but there is some murmurs on the, the social media about oil pulling specifically mm -hmm. with black seed oil. Uh, what are your takes on that? And, and when I say oil pulling, um, if you can explain it to other people, for me, I just think it's like putting oil and water in your mouth or black seed oil and water in your mouth, swishing it and then spitting it out. But, uh, but what exactly is your take on oil pulling and, and does it have an effect on our health oral health? Yeah, no, I, I get asked that question a lot and I'm not against oil pulling. What I am against is people that stay at home that don't see their dentist that notice that when they spit out in the sink, they're bleeding, mm -hmm. there's blood coming out of their mouth. They probably have gum disease thinking. What I'm against is that the thinking that oil pulling and that message is is put out there where oil pulling is the solution for this, that it will reverse gum disease and mm -hmm. it will not. But but let me explain what oil pulling is. So it's an old Arabic uh, uh, practice, which actually does have have some efficacy. Um, and I wouldn't use anything other than probably either olive oil or coconut oil. Uh, it's, it's, you, you don't mix it with water. You take the coconut oil, put it in your mouth. It, it warms up and softens, and then you swish with it for 15 minutes, which by the way, is very difficult to yeah, do, especially, a long time. especially if you're a, uh, if you're a mouth breather. So yeah. you won't see, uh, you know, if you can't breathe your nose, you can't swish for that long. So, 
So um, why did they do that back then? I'm not sure, but it was to promote oral health. Ayurvedic medicine, I'm not against any of that. I'm not against Eastern medicine. It's the, I call it the medicine of observation, mm. um, which I'm an observer, a clinical observer, although I only have one lifetime to observe in, where Ayurvedic medicine, Eastern medicine, uh, is, is that knowledge is passed on from generation of provider to Ayurvedic provider and, and on and on. And it's, so it's tens of thousands of years of clinical observation. So there's some basis to it. Mm -hmm. the, and the way it works is, uh, uh, coconut oil is a very mild emulsifier and people are probably asking, well, you just said swishing with anything is a waste of time. Swishing with coconut oil for 15 minutes because the, it's exposure time, it's not the mechanical action, that eventually the biofilm will thin a little bit because there's this emulsification process. Again, you don't wanna swallow it, you wanna spit it out, you probably wanna spit it out into a little paper towel and put it in the garbage because it can clog up your sinks. I think everyone knows that. But it does emulsify and thin the biofilm. And if you're not brushing and you have a poor diet, that could help. If I wake up with a really dry mouth and for some reason, you know, I couldn't mouth tape. I had a bad cold or something, which thank goodness hasn't happened since I've been mouth taping. But, mm. but then I would, I would oil pull just because it brings back the moisture and it thins that biofilm. Your biofilm gets very thick. If you have a dry mouth, you get that furry feeling, your tongue, your, the teeth, the, you don't get that smooth feeling on your teeth. That's because the biofilm is going to town because there's no saliva to buffer it. And then the, the bacteria are producing a lot of acids and that's demineralizing your teeth and causing gum inflammation. Your immune system's responding when you have a dry mouth to what's going on. And so oil pulling is fine. I think it's, it can be overdone. I would oil pull for five minutes with a quality oil. I would not use sesame seed oil or the mm -hmm. black seed oil. Um, and, uh, but again, back to my, my first comment, it's not going to cure you uh, from, uh, it will thin the biofilm. Mm. And if you're able to brush, then brushing probably will be better. Uh, you know, but if you want to oil pull, that's fine. Let's talk about the big three then right here. So it's going to be brushing, flossing, and tongue scraping. Um, when it comes to brushing, obviously, uh, well, you know, from what I hear, I'm not a dentist. It's, uh, you know, spending at least like two minutes brushing your teeth, going through like every single uh, tooth. We don't have to spend too much time around that. But what some people are wondering is, what exactly do you use as a toothbrush? And what is your process towards taking care of your teeth from the, the brushing all the way down to the flossing, all the way down to the tongue scraping? Well, I mean, uh, I'll just go through my what I do. Um, I, I will brush in the morning. Uh, before breakfast, usually when I wake up. Yeah. And remember, your tongue hasn't been moving around. Saliva flow, even though you're taped closed and you're not dehydrating your mouth, saliva flow is dropped off in the middle of the night because your saliva glands shut down uh, or lessen the amount of saliva they excrete in deep sleep. And that's normal. The body does shut down. Um, and so I, I want to start off with a kind of a fresh start. And the biofilm may have been altered in the middle of the night, even though you've been mouth taping and uh, you've eaten well and you've brushed well before you went to bed. So I brush in the morning and I wanna get some hydroxyapatite mm. product on there, whether it's nano or micro, but that's a new ingredient that we're now finding in toothpaste now, finally in the US, uh, it's better than fluoride. Mm. So I wanna remineralize the teeth and I wanna thin the biofilm. That's my main objective in the morning. I don't floss necessarily, unless I feel the need to, uh, I mentioned that I will oil pull sometimes in the morning. I think that's the best time. And then I'll eat, uh, I'll eat breakfast or I won't eat breakfast. Uh, sometimes often my first meal is at 11 o'clock. It'll be an omelet, uh, with some smoked salmon and mushrooms and leeks. And so, you know, brushing after that, I, I just don't feel the need, but I will brush after dinner. Uh, mm -hmm. the reason I brush after dinner is because it prevents me from snacking before bedtime because that means I have to brush again. Yeah. Uh, and I will floss at that point in time as well. And the reason I do that after dinner and not before bed, which is what we used to recommend, is because the, it's more of my sleep uh, routine where I want the house dark. And if I have to brush and floss, that means the lights come on. Uh, I will literally, my wife and I will brush and floss. Then we'll come down, we'll watch a little TV or we'll read by the fire. Uh, and then, but the lights are all down. 
uh, and then we run upstairs. I'll put my appliance in. She'll put in her appliance. We'll tape hand covers, but that's all done in the dark. We're ready for bed right after dinner, essentially. Mm -hmm. So that's why I brush then. Brushing after dinner, it's the last meal of the, of the, um, of the day. So obviously you want to go to bed with a nice, clean, thinned out. You're not removing the biofilm or the plaque layer. I use those two terms interchangeably. It's the same thing. Um, you, you, the biofilm is there for a reason. You need biofilm. The teeth need protection and they need this outer skin layer, whatever you want to call it, to help bring in minerals from your saliva to help remineralize the teeth and protect them. But you don't want a dysbiotic or a dysfunctional biofilm. And if you're eating a lot of goldfish crackers and snacks and, and things like that during the day and mouth breathing, even talking a lot, exercising a lot, you're dehydrated because you're not taking enough time to drink, your mouth is dry and you're eating carbs, that biofilm is going to be thick and dysfunctional and it's going to be producing a lot of acid. So, mm -hmm. so, so, I would, I, so I basically brush first thing in the morning and after dinner, and then I floss after dinner. I tongue scrape in the morning mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. That's the best time. Tongue is a little bit dry. Needs a little. Needs a little invigoration. Hmm. Do you wait a little bit after your dinner um, to brush your teeth? Maybe like thirty minutes. I heard something like that. Uh, that you should wait a little bit after you have like a meal, or do you brush like right after dinner? Well, I I brush. Well, okay. So after our meal, which is a paleo meal. Yeah. I would brush right afterwards. I would have no hesitation in doing that. What you heard is correct. You don't want to brush after a carb meal because you're, you've pulled enamel off the tooth surface with the acid attack that occurs after that starchy meal. It can be mm. candy. It can be, it can be, uh, it can be something that's acidic like coffee, wine, um, uh, you know, balsamic vinaigrette, you know, anything that's acidic, anything that will demineralize the tooth whether it's by direct action or by indirect action, the bacteria creating acids that they're consuming the carbs, they excrete an acid, um, then you should wait 30 minutes mm -hmm. after coffee, after something acidic, after a snack. But since I've eaten a paleo meal, I wouldn't hesitate doing that. But we, uh, we walk for a mile after dinner. So mm -hmm. by, the time I, by the time I'm brushing, so we eat dinner at 6, 5.45, we walk, it's getting dark now outside. We're home by 7, 7.30, brush and floss on the couch in bed by 10. I mean, mm. so, you, I mean, that's a good point. That's such a, such a good routine. Uh, I, I love that routine. That's like, uh, I would have to add the, the walking a mile after dinner. Cause I just feel like that has such like good purposes from a digestive standpoint as well. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. And, and you lose weight and you don't, you're burning fat mm. And you're burning the meal right after you 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 know you eat it. Uh, it helps sleep. Uh, I record that on my Aura Ring, so it gives mm. me better scores. <laughs> it sees that calorie burn. Um, uh, I think it's great to be able to sit and talk with your spouse. Yeah. You know, sometimes at the dinner table, there's you know you're doing calendars and mm. but walking. I mean, sometimes we'll listen to a book on Audible, uh, but just and then also just seeing the greenery and the the sun setting and and you know you're you're brain is saying, Hey, yeah. it's the end of the day. It's time to go to sleep yeah. as you should be getting out first thing in the morning. Yeah. First thing in the morning, I'll have my bathrobe on. I mean, I'm, we're lucky we don't have any neighbors within sight and I'll walk outside and just soak up that sun, you know, take off the bathrobe a little bit. And I'm <laughs> sipping my, uh, my green iced tea and maybe eating a meat stick, uh, with organ meat in it. I mean, that's yeah. the ideal morning is getting that, that bright sun first thing in the morning. Cause that sets the clock. Mm-hmm. And, oh man, um, I could go some ways with that because there is this, uh, thing on Twitter and social media, which is to say like, uh, to, to sun your private parts in your genital area. Uh, well, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm afraid to do that. I mean, we do have people that drive yeah. by. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I was talking to a friend about that and, and to me, it makes a little bit of sense because we're always yeah. covered up in that area. I, right. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily get the sun exposure that it needs. Um, right. You did mention one thing uh, in passing, which was the hydroxy appetite. Not a lot of people know this. Mm -hmm. I want to tie it into fluoride and why, or actually not why, but what is your take on fluoride, which is what, which is what's in most of our toothpaste. Mm -hmm. It's actually in our water supply as mouth, well. Mouthwash as yeah, well. Yeah, mouthwash. 
Um, right. What exactly is your take on fluoride? And then why do you use uh, hydroxyapatite as a alternative to that? And also, if you can give us the toothpaste that you use as well, that'd be amazing. Absolutely. So, so fluoride is a, it's not a nutrient. It's not a, an essential nutrient. Um, but long ago, there was an American dentist that discovered that uh, people that were drinking the well water in a small town, I think it was Colorado, uh, that the kids had fewer cavities than his buddy down the road in the next town had, and they had a very high level of ambient fluoride in the water. Um, unfortunately, the kids also had other issues like white and brown spots, and but that's called uh, fluorosis or modeling of the teeth. But, you know, again, through correlation, fluoride became the go-to for taking a kind of rubber stamp uh, the greatest invention of public health is what they call it, mm. uh, to addressing the number one disease in the world. And that is decay and, and not addressing the root cause, which is the, the Western diet and agricultural, uh, you know, at the advent of agricultural and eating wheat and processing all that. And, um, so, but anyway, so it became very ubiquitous, like, and then we can put fluoride in the water, fluoride dissipates well in municipal water supplies. And then I'm not going to get into where the fluoride comes from. That's, that's a whole different game. It's an industrial source. It's a byproduct of, of, of waste, waste product of making fertilizer and other, other things in the big food and fertilizer industries. So, so here's, here's what's changed about fluoride. Now I never was a big fan of fluoride. I raised all three of my daughters without fluoride. And back then I didn't have the data that I have now, but I'm so glad I did. It was a lesser of two evils argument for me back then. Mm -hmm. And that was that it doesn't sound very good. It doesn't sound right that we should be adding this and drinking it. And, and, um, and if my kids get a few cavities, Hey, I'm a dentist, I'm a great dentist. I can handle it. Well, it turns out they didn't get cavities. We fed them the right foods. Mm -hmm. And now I'm so glad that I did because their IQs would have been six to nine points less than they would be today. And, you know, that may not seem like a lot to people, but if you take the bell curve and shift it nine points, you know, to the, to the left, I mean, th that has profound changes on a, on a population. I won't go into it, but, but so, so fluoride does remineralize teeth. So does calcium. So does hydroxyapatite, which is the natural form of calcium that is already the ingredient in teeth. But for some reason, human nature, we always think if we find something that's better. We're wonderful. We're superhuman and we should add it. That's, that's our whole thinking. And, and again, let's forget about the root cause of why teeth are rotting out in children's mouth. So, so, and then we'll worry about the toxic effects later. Mm. So now the studies between hydroxyapatite and fluoride, which are both found in the environment and, and in our teeth, not fluoride though, just the hydroxyapatite, that they're, they're pretty much even on efficacy. So knowing that fluoride is dangerous, that's to me, it's a no brainer. And again, the Japanese have been using it for 40 years. It's been around in Europe for at least 10 years. The best form of hydroxyapatite is made in Portugal that is now being used and many, it, being found now in American toothpaste, uh, finally, just in the last few years, uh, that comes from Portugal. So we're, we're kind of behind the times. America is the number one fluoridated country. We out fluoridate everyone combined. Yeah. Europe has pushed back on and has denied putting fluoride into the water. 90%, 97% of the population of fluoride of, of in Europe is, is not drinking fluoridated water. So, so it's, it's a real mismatch there and it worries me for America's sake and for our children's sake. But, but, uh, so I use hydroxyapatite because it's biomimetic. It's already in our body and it works as well, according to a lot of studies, as well as fluoride. Why wouldn't, why would I still be using fluoride? Well, obviously it's just too many things that can go wrong. Fluoride and hydroxyapatite is absorbed. You don't have to swallow it to get the effect, mm. the toxic effects. It is absorbed through the oral mucosa. So if children are using fluoridated toothpaste, and this is really, I think, terrible, even a mom who's pregnant, who's using a fluoridated toothpaste, that fluoride is getting to the child's brain, to mm. the fetal brain, because it's absorbed through the oral mucosa. A lot of things are absorbed through the oral mucosa, just like the gut, right? It's, it's the beginning of the gut. The, um, we, we know that 
sunscreens are carcinogenic. Uh, some sunscreens are. That's absorbed through the skin. The skin has many, many multiple layers. Think of the oral mucosa, one cell thick, it absorbs a lot. So be careful what you put in your mouth. I mean, so fluoridated toothpaste is a, is a mistake. Um, drinking fluoridated water is a mistake because the, the effects, the toxic effects, the long-term effects are so great. Is there a specific uh, toothpaste that you use that you would recommend uh, other people that they can use uh, in lieu of, uh, say, the, like the Colgates and the Sensodynes that are out there? Yeah, well, stay away from the, the big brands. I think Boca yeah. and um, Risewell are doing a good job. I mean, I have, I have those on our, on our website, in our store, uh, online store. But there are others now. There, there's more coming. Wellness has one. The question is now is what else is in the toothpaste mm. that we want to be careful of. So uh, I, I don't want to give too much away, but I, for me, what I think the ideal toothpaste is, it's coming. Yeah. It's probably coming next year, probably Q1, Q2. Uh, I'll, I'll reach out to you, Dan. But yeah. but right now, I, I use Boca and I use Risewell. My, my grandchild uses, uh, my grandchildren use Risewell. Uh, Wellness has a brand. I would stay away from the powders. Yeah. because it has to be in suspension for better uptake. There's a big uh, uh, controversy between nano and micro for now. I wouldn't worry about that. Nano does work better. I have sensitive teeth. The nano in the Boca works great. Yeah. All right. And we did, uh, you did mention something about diet and uh, obviously it has an effect on our overall oral health. So I'm, I have a two year two and a half year old daughter uh, and another one coming along the way. Uh, what would be the perfect diet uh, for both us as adults and also for our loved ones uh, so they can avoid the dentist share, uh, so they can avoid cavities, avoid uh, kind of like the, the stuff that comes along with all that? I think for people that are looking for a short answer, and, and sometimes that's easier because diet is such a yeah. political and <laughs> religious, uh, religious uh, the, relig the religiosity of diet, that's what I call it. Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate that it's become that way. And of course, the big corporations are playing a big part of it. But so the short answer is a paleo diet, mm -hmm. paleo or fat adapted diet. I mean, uh, and I know that doesn't work for a lot of people. And I know uh, we have some vegetarians in the family and, and I, I know they get, they, you know, some get upset, some don't. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's really your choice, but you have to live with your choices. Uh, but again, a paleo diet, I, for example, stay away from goldfish with your daughter. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people think that's pretty neutral. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's a cavity causing product. It's highly fermentable carbohydrates that have been processed way down. All the fiber and, and ingredient, good, good stuff that is in wheat. There is some good stuff in wheat as long as it's not hybridized or, you know, altered. The DNA is not altered, which is difficult to find these days. But in Europe, it's not. Um, you know, stay away from those, stay away from candies. Now, occasionally, you know, follow the 80, 20 rule. If you're doing it right, 80% of the time, maybe 90% of the time I try for 95%. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I'll do a, a little bit of dark chocolate every day. It's good for nitric oxide and theobromin and all these other, it, it's a superfood. Um, it's caloric, but you know, if it's 76% and higher, that's a great snack. Uh, my granddaughter loves the chocolate that I give her. And we snack on a bar of chocolate together sometimes, but you know, um, find snacks that work. Uh, we, we live in a snack based <laughs> society and, and, uh, our ancestors didn't snack. They didn't have the opportunity. Yeah. We didn't, I mean, they would, they would probably sit down and do one major meal because it took so long to prepare and they had, you know, if they were migrating, they had to sit down and really establish a base and to cook. And, and so, uh, I, I mean, I used to think eating a little bit seven, eight times a day was the thing to do. And mm. it's not, it's not. So, so even intermittent fasting has its benefits for oral health. Mm. The, the, every time the mouth sees food, the teeth undergo this demineralization attack, even if it's good food, it's, it's much less if it's a good food, but you know, the body has to recover and the body has the mouth has systems in place that help remineralize teeth. But if you're constantly snacking, then the demineralization is going to outweigh the remineralization part of the equation. Mm. And, but if you're eating one or two meals a day, and maybe you snack on some celery where there's no acid attack from that, 
then your, your, your teeth are able to restore themselves. So, so short answer is, and everyone knows this, it's, it's, it's the diet that our ancestors ate. They weren't brushing and flossing. They didn't have toothpaste and they, they occasionally we find a skull with some teeth in it and, and we've, we, we've found lots of them. Trust me, we've got a good sample size. Uh, we find a little cavity. We find more wear and tear on the teeth and grinding and, and, and things like that. But, but no, it, there's no gum disease and it's not the most prevalent disease in that population like it is now. It's done a complete reversal, flip-flop. And it's nice. diet. It's diet-based. So Nice. All right. This has been amazing. Uh, I've been learning a lot. I love taking these little sessions and turning them to like mentorship sessions a little bit. And one thing I want to just uh, thank you for is making oral health and dentistry accessible to people like myself. Um, I think there's a lot of, especially for me, there was a lot of shame around my dental health uh, because of the way that my dentist had approached it. Um, mm -hmm. Like even my first, like when I was a kid, my first uh, experience with a dentist was like, I think, I think I got like hit or something like that from like this dentist, like for not sitting in yep. a chair and, and getting, you know, yep. getting pain or whatnot. So I just want to thank I you. For, that. I hear that uh, a lot. It's yeah. your fault for being a bad person yeah. for getting those cavities, yeah. but you're not being told that it's the number one disease in the world. Mm -hmm. And and why is that your fault that you're, you're not is it your fault that you're not aware of why you're getting those cavities? Come on. Yeah. I mean, and this is an aspect of the profession. So I, I thank you for that. Uh, I, I do. I want that awareness to be there. I want to take away the shame. Uh, a, a lot of, I feel so bad for so many that have had either bad dental care, no dental care, no access to dental care. They're missing a lot of teeth. Their life is shorter for a result of it will be uh, their, their, quality of life is different. Being able to digest certain foods is affected, certainly. Um, but they they won't smile. Mm -hmm. I mean, th that's just one aspect of it. But if you're not able to smile mm -hmm. and project your identity, that's where the mouth is in that pole position and, and has a very critical role in so many things, including self-esteem. Yeah, it's uh, the that ability to smile and be confident in that smile. Mm -hmm it sends mm -hmm. off all these little messages in our brains and the poor self image and for and other people's brains, the people you're yeah. around, your employer, yeah. the people that are going to hire you, your, your yeah. future mates, uh, you know, you're, yeah, you're right. So yeah. no, I, I thank you for that. Um, and, 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 and that's why I'm very passionate about this, this provider list that we have online of providers. Mm -hmm. When you go see a functional dentist, they're not going to shame you. They're going to educate you. They're, they're going to help you realize that it's not your fault that you need to, because you, you haven't been told the right things. Mm. And to be told, you know, I, I used to get asked this question a lot, you know, between, so a spouse will come in and they'll go, you know, I'm getting all the cavities and my spouse at home, my mate at home doesn't even floss and they get no cavities. <laughs> yes. Well, it's not about flossing and brushing yeah. that holy, that Trinity of holy Trinity and dentistry of, well, just come see us twice a year, mm. you know, uh, you know, brush and floss, um, don't eat sugar. I mean, that, that it's so much more than that. And, and patients need to know that. So, so don't, don't take it personally, find yeah. someone that you feel comfortable with that doesn't shame you and learn. I mean, it's doable. It's reversible. Yeah. We're going to have everything in the show notes. So if you're listening to this or if you're watching this, uh, it's going to be either in the description on YouTube, or it's going to be in the show notes. Uh, we're going to have links to the letter that uh, Dr. B has given us as well, if you need to take it to uh, your health practitioner. And um, to end off this uh, interview, I have a couple of just like rapid fire uh, questions uh -oh. from Twitter. I told you before we got into this interview that I put your name out there and I said, hey, I'm going to be talking to uh, Dr. B about all things dentistry. And I got like hundreds of responses. And and I had to at some point be like, yo, guys, just just stop. Like right now, this, this is way too much. I can't ask him a hundred questions. So um, I'm going to ask you a couple of rapid fire questions. You can give me like a two to three sentence, uh, just explanation of it. And these are just things that are on the minds of, uh, of a lot of like the general public. So mercury fillings, are they dangerous? Yes. Okay. I mean, terrible. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, can you reverse gum recession? That's a tough one. Um, you would need to find a very talented periodontal gum surgeon. Okay. Uh, there is something called the pinhole technique. 
that's really based on case selection, but when it goes well, it goes very well. Mm. Uh, when people are concerned about gum recession, first find out what caused it mm. so that you can stop whatever that was that caused it because gum recession will continue even if you try and reverse it. So first find out what the root cause was mm. so that it doesn't get worse. Mind if I ask what usually are the root causes for gum recession? Uh, overbrushing, grinding, certain foods, chewing patterns, um, uh, gum disease in itself, inf inflammation in the mouth because the gums heal themselves by eating away and necrosing and lowering. Okay. Um, this is this is actually a question for me. Uh, bruxism, oh. uh, grinding, teeth grinding. Yep. Yep. Um, is what exactly is the true cause of teeth grinding? Uh, aside from mouth tape, is there anything else that we can do to prevent uh, grinding of the teeth? Grinding and bruxism, um, it's a very complicated topic. It is not well understood. And hence, all the treatment modalities are all over the map in dentistry. So it's confusing to patients, as it is confusing to a lot of practitioners. Recently, we've divided it into two categories because the, the root cause, we've discovered new root causes. So there's nighttime grinding mm -hmm. or bruxism. It's called sleep bruxism. And then there's daytime grinding. Sleep bruxism, we think, is caused by the apneas and the, 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 the mechanism or the action of grinding actually helps in reversing an apnea, we think, because it happens at, a, at the same time. So we know that they're related. We just don't know how. Um, so if you're grinding, you probably do have some sleep disorder breathing issues. Mm -hmm. There's a strong correlation there. So if you're grinding and you're just getting a night guard from your dentist, that could actually be making the sleep apnea worse because it's opening up your vertical dimension because the device is in place and that can alter the position of certain bones and tissues around your airway. So, so that's the wrong approach. Um, Grinding and I mean, the, the stress etiology or the, the reason for grinding due to stress, especially in children, I don't think that's to, to, be, to be the case. Hmm. And there certainly are bite issues, which is really kind of the foundation of why grinding occurs. If your bite is off and your teeth are in the wrong position, that can trigger daytime grinding, whether it triggers nighttime grinding is, is debatable. So, so it's a very complicated, as, as is occlusion, the bite, Grinding and bruxism is very complicated. Make sure you're seeing a, an expert in the field. Most general dentists that are just throwing in a device to help protect the teeth, which is very noble, I get it, like what happened to you, yeah. uh, that's, that could be potentially very dangerous because they're not aware and treating the root causes. They're not working and, and uh, working upstream. You, you don't understand how that makes me feel because I've been told so many times to wear this night guard, right? And the night, the night guard itself, I, I can't wear it at night. It's just something is like off and my teeth feel off when I wear the night guard in, in general. Right. And I was like, please, someone tell me something other than wearing a night guard to help me avoid this bruxism, help me avoid the grinding of my teeth. Um, and then that's where I went down the rabbit hole of acidentist.com, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So best uh, toothbrush on the market. The one you're using. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, no. so uh, nothing special uh, then. Yeah. I mean, um, soft, uh, new. Yeah. In other words, it can get worn very quickly. Nylon will wear and become like little thousands of knives, just mm. cutting away at your enamel and causing gum recession. Mm. Um, so high quality. I mean, end rounded, hemispherical tufts. Mm -hmm. uh, soft as possible, uh, and nano brushes now are coming out, silicone tips. Uh, I mean, um, again, it's plastic though, and it ends up in the landfill and it's still, is there a chance of microplastics coming off in your mouth? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, I think the, the best toothbrush is not, is not needing to use a toothbrush. Yeah. And but unfortunately in today's world, that's impossible. So, so pick a high quality one. And then of course, there's the question between electric and, and, um, and manual. And I go back and forth. I use manual about 60, 70% of the time. It's more convenient. I can take my time, the tactile feedback. I know where I am, but electric toothbrushes in certain cases, certain patients, if you have a lot of dental restorations, 
uh, they can be beneficial, but they can also be very damaging as well. So yeah. you have to be careful. Yeah. Uh, bring your toothbrush, bring your toothbrushes to your dentist and to your hygienist and discuss it and show them how you brush and they'll give you instant feedback. That's the best way to do it. Okay. Which ones do you use or what's the toothbrush that you use on a regular basis? I use a radius. A radius? radius. Okay. Made on the East Coast. It's a, a woman owned uh, company. Uh, they make uh, a biodegradable floss out of silk. Okay. Uh, so I use a radius toothbrush. I love the handle. The handle, which is 90%, 80% of the toothbrush is a recycled plastic handle. And I've had the same handle for the last 10 years. Nice. And I just buy the heads. It's the small radius, uh, a electric toothbrush. The, my electric toothbrush right now, I'm using a Boca, which is a Sonicare knockoff. It's mm -hmm. well-made. Uh, I like the head. Uh, Sonicare makes a good toothbrush. If you have a lot of staining, I would use an Oral-B Brawn. Mm -hmm. That's better for removing stain. And if you have a thick pellicle, uh, if you're trying to get in between the teeth, uh, I mean, I've told people for a long time, if you're using electric toothbrushes, use both of them, use the sonic and use the oscillatory mm -hmm. pulsing one, because they both are good at different things. I mean, gotcha. that's ridiculous. I mean, how much countertop space do you have in your bathroom? Right. Yeah. You know, what are your thoughts on pulling wisdom teeth? Uh, an unfortunate necessity in today's mm -hmm. world, uh, mm -hmm. because of how we're developing and growing. My lower jaw is small teeth came in fine until the wisdom teeth came in and there was no room and they came in sideways. Mm -hmm. They didn't even come in. They just were lying on their side and, you know, getting to them and removing them was, was very difficult. Um, so it's a mismatch disease, really. It's, it's a, it's a condition where because of our environment, we're not allowed to fully develop to our genetic potential. Mm -hmm. And we have, well, we all have the same, well, 99% of us have the same number of teeth. Um, and as they come in, the last ones that come in, there's no room for them. And when that happens, they can cause a lot of problems later in life, even life threatening problems. And that's why we look to get them removed at the safest time to remove them. Gotcha. And that happens to be in the late teens, early twenties to get done. So, yeah. Uh, awesome. Okay. So what are some apps that you use on a regular basis to optimize mm -hmm. your health? Ooh, um, that's a great question. Uh, so I listen to a lot of podcasts. I like podcasts. So, you know, when we take our walks, yeah. we listen to a lot of podcasts. I love, uh, you, you know, early on, I'll, let me start off early on influences. Uh, Mark Sisson, hmm. uh, Mark's Daily Apple. Uh, that's where I learned to become fat adapt, how to become fat adapted. I applied that to all my patients uh, because it helps with gum disease and it also helps with uh, appetite control and all that uh, and overall health. So I love what he has done and is still doing um, an app. Uh, well, I mean, Aura Ring. Aura yeah. Ring has been very influential. I mean, I, I'm just, uh, I mean, I, I, I look at this, you know, like 92 this morning. I mean, to me, that is kind of low. I, I like to get 95s, but that has changed my behavior, that app. It's not perfect. What I know about sleep and the, the, you know, proper sleep studies and all that, it's not perfect, but boy, what a game changer. So that's, that's one I'm trying to think. Um, uh, I, I think the best app is the one that actually, you know, affects change. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why the aura ring is so great. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I are so, so much in, into sleep and that's where we get this rhythm and, 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 um, what else? Uh, there was another one. Um, trying to think. Um, I, I can't think of anything right now. I mean, I'm I'm so all over the place. Uh, I do use the Circadian Rhythm app when I okay. travel. I okay. love that. Uh, I forget what the name is. I can I'll, I'll give it to you. And we can put it in the show notes. Yeah. But yeah. but just got back from Spain two weeks in Spain, and and that app tells me how to modify my sleep before the flight and after the flight and between the two flights so that I don't suffer greatly. Um, so I, I try and keep that aura ring score as, as consistent as possible. So the second night in, in Madrid, uh, I got a 92. I mean, that's phenomenal. I never used to be able to do that, but that's because I worked up to it. So that's a great app. If you travel a lot, if you're a business traveler, or, um, uh, podcasts, I, I love broken brain or drew pros podcast. Uh, uh, Mark Hyman has, uh, Mark Hyman's been very influential. I love his books. Food Fix is a wonderful book. I recommend reading that. 
uh, books are still my apps. I mean, there's a Canadian, Kate Rumbleu, uh, that wrote, I think, I mean, I think breath and the calcium paradox are the two most influential best books to read in the last five, 10 years. Uh, James Nestor, of course, uh, wrote breath. So, so books are great apps. I think apps, I would be wary of apps. Um, they make me a little nervous. Uh, mm. I've used a lot of apps. Um, and, uh, I think if you can, I think if an app can change your behavior, I think it's great. Yeah. Uh, well, let me just leave it at that. Yeah. If it can change your behavior for the good, there are some apps the out there that, yeah. that, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. definitely go the other way. Um, right. okay. Right. So last Twitter question right here, which is, uh, biggest dental scams. Um, <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble or anything like that, no, but you no, are no. retired. So yeah. 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 No, yeah. no, no. I'm already in trouble. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fluoride, the pro fluoride people. Uh, uh, yeah, no, that's yeah. not a problem. Um, uh, I've, I've got enough people supporting me to, to help me get through this. So, so, um, biggest dental scams, that is a great question. And it's always important in any profession. Yeah anywhere. I mean, it's not just dentistry. It's always good to be aware of the scams because if you get in too deep and then you, you know, 10 years later, you're like, oh, damn, I, I got sucked into that. And so there are scams in dentistry. Unfortunately, there are dentists that overtreat. There are also dentists that undertreat. That's not a scam, but that can hurt you. Um, but um, the, the, the big scam in the US, I think dental insurance is a scam. Let's start mm -hmm. off with that. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't expect me to say that, but it's not insurance. Yeah. It doesn't, uh, let's say I fall off my mountain bike uh, later this afternoon when I, when I'm riding and I knock out all my teeth, I, I'm, I only have a thousand dollars worth of coverage for the year, or maybe 1500 at most. That's a benefit. It's a service and it doesn't cover everything. And it's pieced out by percentages. It's not like medical, uh, uh, like medical, uh, healthcare insurance where mm -hmm. you're covered up to a certain amount, but for everything. And especially for trauma and all that. So, so that's a scam, I think. Uh, and they make a lot of money from it, not overall in total dollars, but it's a more uh, profitable product than medical insurance is because it's predictable. They've made it so that it's so predictable and the actuaries can apply their formula and they know that every plan is profitable. There's no loss. That's a scam to me. And to call it dental insurance is that scam territory. So uh, that, <laughs> Don't get me started. I, I don't want to talk anymore about that, but a, other scams. Another yeah. popular scam in dentistry is the soft tissue management program. These are consultants that come in after the fact and they tell you, listen, how many hygiene profies do you have a day per month? I mean, that's a measure of the success of a practice, not necessarily the best measure, but it is a common measure that, that dentists pay a lot of money to these consultants to tell them. And then they say, well, okay, if you could get a hundred dollars more out of each of those patients, then you're this much more profitable. It's called the hygiene machine. And I'm not saying hygiene is a bad thing. You should be seeing your dentist on a regular basis and your hygienist is the key person to be seeing in that dental practice. Um, however, the, the, the consultants will tell the dentist, listen, redefine how you see gum disease. And by doing that, you've, you've dropped the threshold for people that need the scale and root planing. And insurance pays 80% of that. And a cleaning in the US costs 115, 120 bucks. But a scale and root planing, which takes one or two or three more visits, that's six to eight hundred dollars. Mm. So right there you've you've forexed your 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 production for, for the year. So be careful of the people of the dentists that are very aggressive. Uh, if if you do get that that diagnosis that you have gum disease and you don't you think there's something wrong, go get a second opinion. That's all. Just get a second opinion. And, um, I would say seven times out of 10, you will be glad that you did. Hmm. Okay. So oh, mouthwash, biggest scam in dentistry right yeah. there. Sorry. Yeah. And, and there are some things about mouthwash. I think some, they put it in gyms and I've, uh, I was listening to a podcast with Max Lugarv, uh, he was doing with Joe Rogan and great yeah, yeah, great guy. Love it. Love him. Um, yep. Yeah, he's he's stuff, in oral yeah. health, which is wonderful. Oh yeah. And his, his mom passed away of Alzheimer's. I recommend you yeah. see his new film, yeah. but, um, but Alzheimer's and oral health, he gets it. There's mm -hmm. a connection and, and he's lived it. So I'm yeah. glad he's promoting that. He did mention something about mouthwash in the sense that you do something. If you take mouthwash after your, uh, your workout, you actually ruin your post-workout gains. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, 
I know I said last question, but or last Twitter question, but <laughs> what, how did, how exactly does that work? Well, it can a variety of reasons, but he's talking he's he's talking about the the, the effect on the organisms that mm. create the nitric oxide, uh, gotcha. which helps muscle building. And I mean, nitric oxide is amazing. Yeah, we, we should do a whole yes. show just on nitric oxide. But first, read the book Breath. That'll be a great intro for nitric oxide. That is the fountain of youth. And yeah. if we're breathing through our mouths and and suffering from breathing issues, we are greatly handicapped yeah. because mostly because of nitric oxide. But, and, and that is produced, uh, I think like a quarter of it is produced in our noses, in our nasal exactly. cavities. Okay. And as we get older, here's the thing. So initially it's, it, up until age 40, our endothelial cells and other cells in our body, the, in the lining of the blood vessels, one source, it, it's producing the nitric oxide. But that is actually now become an indicator for aging, like mm. how quickly are you aging? What is your nitric oxide production? Mm. Because that wanes at age 40. The good news is that if you're eating well, there are bugs on the back of your tongue and in your nose, mostly on the back of the tongue, that when they see beets and foods that promote nitric oxide or promote the life of those bacteria and the health of those bacteria, you're still able to produce a lot of nitric oxide. So it's about your diet. It's what happens in the mouth. I'm about to buy me some beets right now. A whole yeah, bunch I eat, of them. I eat beets every day at lunch. Um, a beet break. Yeah. Such a great performance enhancer as well. Oh, totally. my God. oh it's just yeah. amazing. I remember taking yeah. beet juice before uh, my Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and then it was just like, it would just give me a little bit more endurance. It was Absolutely just uh, right. incredible. Okay. Yep. So three last questions for you. Uh, right. Number one is uh, what are some things we do now that in a hundred years people would consider weird or dangerous? Mouthwash. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, I would say, yeah, I mean, that's just the first thing that popped into my head. Uh, I think, um, I think, uh, uh, iPhone use, mm. I mean, uh, tech, uh, relying on technology for things that we already know in us <laughs> that are, you know, I mean, I, I think really, I think our reliance on, on tech for health, yeah. uh, other than, I mean, obviously diagnostics and, and getting the data, that's important. But, yeah. but, uh, and, and I think AI, I think AI will, will regret AI yeah. when it comes to healthcare. Uh, okay. If you could write down one question beside on your bedside and have the answer tomorrow morning, Ooh. what would that question be? Wow. Um, I, I'm just going to go with the first thing that popped in my head. Yes. I don't know why, 100%. but how, how can we emancipate women on this planet? completely hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, you know, equality. Uh, I think that would help so much. I mean, there are other things, obviously I have so many questions and no answers. Uh, uh, but, uh, I just, the first thing that popped in my head. Beautiful. Okay. I, I, have, I have three daughters. I have three daughters. That's probably why I'm so focused on that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, shout out to your daughter, uh, who's helping you with the Instagram and the uh, website I'm who put you out there in the first place. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm so thankful for her because, you know, we got to, to glean from your wisdom. Uh, so shout out to her. Uh, she's, your... she's the brains. She's the brains behind the operation. What's her name, by the way? If Catherine. You... Catherine. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. We appreciate you. Thank you, Catherine. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yes. And, we'll uh, where... <laughs> yeah. And where can people find you? Uh, Instagram, uh, our website, ask the dentist, uh, Type in my last name uh, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. You'll uh, for the book on sleep. Um, uh, lots of podcasts. I have a podcast. Ask the dentist. Um, and uh, well, if I think of anything else, I can put it in the show notes. But uh, yeah. and and feel free to reach out. I mean, the premise is is ask your dentist. I mean, get get the answers. Don't just sit there and take our word for it. Uh, you know, you, you need you, you need to be self actualized as a patient in today's world. And, uh, and part of that is going online and, yeah. and be careful who you follow too. be very careful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of characters out there, especially in the social media world. Uh, so Dr. B want to thank you for coming on this podcast. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, definitely was taking a lot of notes. I'm going to be passing this down to my family and thank you very much for that. That was huge. And, uh, and I think the people listening to this are, are, are going to have some clarity in regards to how they take care of their oral health and actually how they 
can integrate everything from their physical health to their sleep to their dental health as well. So I just want to thank you for taking the time coming on to this podcast. And if you are watching this or listening to this, it is Ask the Dentist on all platforms. He's on askthedentist.com. We're going to have his links on the show notes and uh, also links to all the products uh, that he was talking about. And Dr. B, I want to thank you again for coming on. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And thanks for thinking of oral health as a topic for all your listeners. I appreciate that.